So now we've talked about how things might cross the membrane. We've talked about how ions might cross the membrane through a channel, how water could cross through channels or even just past the phospholipids, and how larger things like amino acids might cross a membrane through a carrier, um, either a uniport or a co-transport. But we need to talk about why something would cross the membrane and in which direction. Would, why would sodium go into a cell or would it go out of a cell or which way would it move and why? So let's, t let's talk about the things that might cause something to move around. And first, let's imagine, just to illustrate an idea, let's take a container of water and we will put a bunch of dye molecules here in the center. We'll put a, a concentrated drop of dye right there. So notice right now there's no dye in this part of the water and a lot of it right there. Now think for a moment. You know the answer to this. If I come back a little bit later, where will the dye be? Now most likely your answer is that it will have spread out. And my question for you is why? Why, why will it spread out? I agree that it will, but how do you know that? And why would it do that? So the most common answer is because things want to move from where there's more of it to where there's less, but we want to make sure that we don't have to use that kind of anthropomorphization. These are molecules. They don't want anything. So let's see if we can get at the underlying reasons why we can be sure, almost sure, that this will spread out over time. So let's start from the assumption that the movement of every molecule is random. Now, let's kind of draw a close-up here of the very edge of this thing. So over here we'll draw, here's the center of that dime droplet, and out here is the edge of it. So here's all of our dye molecules. What I've drawn here is just a close-up of this area right here. Now consider these molecules here at the edge of the dye droplet. Let's assume each of them, since it's moving randomly, has a 50% chance of moving away from the center of the die and a 50% chance of moving toward the center of the die. So if I looked at this one and I flipped a coin, let's say this one's going to end up moving this way in the next moment in time. But this one is going to move that way. And so there will be 50% chance for, on average, half of them will move each will move out and half of them will move in. So at the next moment in time, if half of them are moving out and half are moving in, where will the die be at the next moment? Well, some of these will have moved out further and some of them will have moved in toward the middle, but some of the ones there toward the middle will also have moved out and some will have moved in. So just by random chance, at the next moment in time, we expect some of them have moved outward. Now, take the next moment in time. Of the ones here on the edge, half of them will move further away, and about half of them will move in, but some of the ones at the next layer in will move out, and some will move in. And then at the next moment in time, again, half will have moved out, and half will, and so on. You get the idea. At every step in the process, we expect some molecules to be moving toward the outside. So if I looked at where there is any dye, I would start with there being a lot here and none here. And then I'd have a little less here, some here, and none here. And then a little less here, some more here, some, a little bit here, and none here. It's spreading out. And it's not doing it because it wants to go anywhere. It's doing it by random chance. Just by random movement, things will tend to spread out over time. Now, one important thing to notice about that. If I let this sit for a long time, most likely, over time, things will spread out until they are equally distributed. I will have gone from one concentrated drop of dye to that dye spread out randomly throughout my beaker. Now, each of these molecules is still moving randomly. So, is there some chance that 
from one moment in time to the other, all of them will move in one direction? Sure, it's possible. It's unlikely, very unlikely, but possible. For the same reason that if I've got a hundred coins and I flip them all, is it possible they will all end up end up coming up heads? Sure, but it's very unlikely, extremely unlikely. Likewise, here's a question for you. I put in that drop of dye and I come back later and it's spread evenly throughout the beaker. Is it possible that I will come back in a day and find all of it back at the center in the form of a droplet? It's tempting to answer no, but let me ask this. Is it possible? The answer is yes. It is theoretically possible for all of those dye molecules by random movement to all move toward the middle. In the same sense that it's possible that if you had a million coins and flipped them, they would all come up heads. The chance of that is so small as to be ignorable, but it's not zero. It is possible. So, what we say is that at any given moment, it is most likely that things will spread out. We call that process diffusion. Diffusion is the tendency of things to spread out by random movement. And in order to talk about diffusion, we need to make sure we talk about the concept of concentration. When we talk about a solution, one material dissolved in another, it's important to be able to talk about the concentration. So concentration is the amount of a solute in a given volume of solution. So for example, if this is one liter and in it there, uh, there is half a mole Mole is, uh, if you're not familiar with it, is a, just a quantity term, like dozen means 12. Mole just means a larger number than that. It's about uh, 6 times 10 to the 23rd. So it's a number we use to describe a number of molecules rather than, like, say, donuts. A mole of donuts would be a lot. But if I had half of a mole of solute molecules in one liter of total solution, I would call that... 0.5 molar would be the concentration, or the abbreviation is capital M. One half of a mole per one liter. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some about how to talk about concentrations in one of our labs. But right now, what I wanted to do is this. If I start with all of my molecules here in the center, then I would say this area has a high concentration whereas these other areas that have no dye molecules have a low concentration. In other words, what I've got is what we call a concentration gradient, which is a difference in concentration from one location to the next. So concentration gradient is a difference in concentration between two locations. If I were to try to draw a graph of concentration here, what I might say is that here's our graph of place versus concentration. I would see that it's low here high here and low here. So there's a concentration gradient between here and here or here and here, between this spot and these other spots. Now, I can say 
in diffusion. We said diffusion is the tendency of things to spread out. Another way of saying that is diffusion is the tendency for things to move down their concentration gradient from where it's high to where it's low. Diffusion says that these molecules over time will tend to move from where there's more of them to where there's less of them. In other words, they'll spread out. Now, very important, diffusion does not say that any one particular molecule will move in any direction. The movement of each molecule is random. If I looked at one molecule here on the edge of this thing and I said, which direction is it more likely to move, this way or that way? It's tempting to say that way toward low concentration, but that is not correct. That molecule has a 50-50 chance of moving either way. But diffusion says that for the whole group of molecules, the whole population, on average, they will tend to move to where there is less concentration, from high to low concentration. Not individual ones, but as a population. I hope that difference makes sense. It's very important. So, we can also put numbers on this. We could say, let's say that this is a concentration of 2 molar right here, and out here it's 0 molar. Well, then diffusion says that overall, overall the movement will be this way. So, let's look at another example of how this might work. If you're taking notes, you might draw a new bucket. Let's imagine that we have a bucket and we're going to put a barrier here in the middle. And on this side, we will have some dye spread out evenly across all of this side. And we'll say the concentration here is 500, I'm going to put little m, big M. That's 500 millimolar, 500 thousandths of a mole per liter. In physiology, we will very rarely have solutions as concentrated as one full molar. Usually they're in millimolar, so 10 millimolar or 500 millimolar, like millimeter and meter, same idea. And on this side, we'll have a concentration of zero millimolar, no dye over there. And let's say these two sides have equal volume. Each of these sides is half a liter. Now, when I take this barrier away, which way will the dye tend to move overall? Now, if we think about that as a concentration gradient, we would say that our concentration gradient is higher here, lower here. So which way will it move? From high to low. The molecules are going to tend to move this way. So when I take that barrier out, we expect to see the dye molecules start to spread into this area. Can I say that any individual dye molecule is going to go that way? No. But overall, they will tend to go that way. So when I take that barrier out, what will happen to this concentration number as I start to get dye molecules on this side? Will it go up or down? My answer would be, right now it says there are zero moles per liter, and as some dye molecules move over here, it's going to go up. How about this number? Well, if we take some of the dye molecules away, it's going to go down. And if these two things are equal, so equal volume, then when we allow this to diffuse and let it go for long enough, what numbers do I expect to see here and here? So there's a couple ways you could think about that. If these are equal size, then as those dye molecules spread out, half of them should be over here, which means now there's half as much dye in this amount of water, which means this should be half as much. It goes from 500 to 250. The other half is now over here. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about. Now here's one more question. So when I've taken that barrier away and this stuff has spread out, now this is what I see. When this is the case, when I'm now seeing same concentrations over here, the molecules are still moving. Some of the molecules are still crossing from here to here. Others are crossing from here to here. Diffusion, the movement of the molecules, has not stopped. But will there be any overall movement? Will I see more molecules moving that way 
or that way? And the answer is neither. You will see approximately equal numbers of molecules moving this way and moving that way. Before, when this was still zero, the movement was like this. Now, the movement is like this. Equal and op actually, a better way to draw that would be before it was like this, now it's like this. Equal and opposite movement. And this situation is, an, is in equilibrium. This is inherently stable, and if I leave it alone, I don't have to do anything to make sure that these numbers don't change. They will generally not change over time. Something would have to force them to change in order to see any difference. I'd have to have some way of making these molecules move one way or the other in order to get these numbers to change. Hypothetically, it is ran possible by random movement that they will shift slightly, but overall, they will not shift over time. Now, that's the basic idea of diffusion. We do need to spend a moment to talk about a sp the variant on that, which is facilitated diffusion. So, I'm going to redraw this with a slight difference. I'm going to put a membrane here in the middle of my bucket, dividing it into two halves. And on one half, I'm going to make sodium ions at a concentration of 100 millimolar. And we'll also put chloride ions over here at a concentration of 100 millimolar. And on this side, I'll put sodium at 10 millimolar and chloride at 10 millimolar. Let's say right now that this is just a phospholipid bilayer, just a simple membrane. Remember, ions cannot cross a phospholipid bilayer on their own. So if I say go, which way will sodium move? Is there a concentration gradient? Yes, higher over here than here, and things tend to diffuse from high to low concentration. But in this case, since sodium cannot cross this barrier, nothing's going to happen. Sodium will not move, neither will chloride. So there will not be any overall diffusion. However, what happens if I put in one sodium channel? And just to keep this from getting complicated in a way that we'll get to later, also a chloride channel. Now, which way will sodium tend to go? Well. There's still a concentration gradient from high to low, and now there's a way for sodium to get across this barrier. So now diffusion will happen. It will be limited because there's only one place for this to go. It's sort of like if you've got a big crowd wanting to get into a nightclub, but there's only one door and there's somebody on there letting one person at a time, the rate at which people can get in is relatively low. It'll be a while before that crowd disperse gets done. So. This will allow diffusion, but at a slow rate. It won't change the end result. But I wanted to point out something here. If I watch the movement of sodium through this channel, will I see sodium moving that way? Will I see any sodium ions crossing from here to here? Yes, should be. By random movement, some of them will. Will I see any sodium ions crossing from here to here? Yes. Not very many, but remember, this is random movement. There are sodium ions here. Some of them will go that way. So one way you might draw this is to say there's more movement that direction than that direction. Since that arrow is bigger than that arrow, the overall movement is going to be that way. This number will go down. That number will go up. Same for chloride. Say you would have the same arrows. When you're having something diffuse through a membrane where it can only go through at certain locations, where you've put in a channel or a carrier or some kind of transporter that allows it to move, what you're doing is facilitated diffusion. 
It follows the same basic rules. It goes from high to low concentration. We'll get to some subtleties. But the rate at which it moves can be limited by the number of places it can go. And depending on what kind of things you put in there, you can get some other interesting properties, which are going to be very important as we go through the nervous system. And I'll get to those in the next lecture. I'll get start getting to them. But the idea of facilitated diffusion is that it's diffusion across a membrane that is allowed by transporters in the membrane. That's obviously mostly how things work when we're talking about going into or out of cells. So before we go on, I'm going to give you a problem to think about. All right, so I've got water here divided into two equal halves by a membrane, and I've got three different solutes in here, the sugar ribose, the sugar glucose, and the amino acid glutamate. Here are their concentrations in millimolar. Ribose at 50 to 10, glucose at 200 to 100, and glutamate at 10 to 100. My question for you is this. Overall, which direction will ribose be moving, which direction will glucose be moving, and which direction will glutamate be moving? The second part of the question is, assuming these two halves are of equal volume, what will be the concentrations of each of these when this whole system reaches equilibrium? So there's your two questions. Which direction is each going to move overall? And what will be the concentrations of each at equilibrium? And then a third question I want you to think about, and I'll give you the answer to this one right now is, which one will be moving fastest? So in which one will the rate of diffusion be greatest? Now that one I'll answer right now because we haven't really talked about it yet. If I consider how quickly each of these will diffuse, what I need to consider is the rate, assuming they have equal numbers of transporters for each of them. So let's make that assumption. That's a good thing to, to note. The other thing I need to consider is the ratio of concentrations, higher divided by lower. So what's the concentration ratio for ribose? That's a ratio of 50 to 10, which is 5. It's 5 times greater. For glucose, 200 divided by 100, there's a 2 times ratio here. And for glutamate, it's 100 divided by 10, there's a 10 times ratio. So which of them has the biggest ratio of concentrations? That would be glutamate. So glutamate will actually have the most rapid initial rate of diffusion. Glucose will have the slowest initial rate of diffusion. And one way you can, you can think about that is with glucose, we've got more things here than here, so there will be more movement in this direction. But proportionally, there's still quite a bit over here, and, some, and there will be still a fair amount moving backward, which will make it look like there's less moving this way overall. Here. There's a lot moving this way and very few moving that way since this number is small. So most of the movement is this direction, if that helps you think about it. Okay, so pause for a moment and try to answer the first question. Which way will each be moving at first? And what will be the final concentrations when this reaches equilibrium? Pause. All right, now let's talk about the answer. Assuming these two sides are, of e are equal, equal in volume, then the final concentration on each side should be the average should be the average of these so 50 and 10 together that's 60 split it in half and i'll get 30 and 30 200 and 100 together that's 300 put it in half and that's 150 and 150 110 110 split in half that's 55 and 55. That's what I should see at equilibrium. And the overall movement 
of each of the well it went from high to low for each of them so that's you will have problems like that on an exam all right so that's the idea of diffusion and facilitated diffusion it's worth noting diffusion is a form of passive transport it does not require any input of energy to get it to happen. It happens on its own. So diffusion and facilitated diffusion are a form of passive transport. Another form of passive transport is osmosis. And that's another one we're going to talk about. Osmosis is the movement of water specifically across a membrane. So let's put a bucket of water here and divide it with a membrane. Now, let's assume that water can cross this membrane. So we'll say water, yes, it can cross. But let's put some other solute in here. We'll put on this side glucose at 100 millimolar and on this side glucose at 10 millimolar. And we'll say, actually, let's approach it both ways. If we said glucose can cross this barrier, then what will happen? Well, diffusion says glucose will diffuse from here to here until it's equally spread out. But what if glucose can't? What if glucose cannot cross this barrier? Will water cross the barrier? The answer is yes. And in which direction? It's going to go that way. Water will go this way, toward the higher glucose concentration. Now, the question that often comes up is, why? And there's a lot of answers given for this, some of which are not technically correct. but Probably the most common way of thinking about this is that water is going from where it's more concentrated to where it's less concentrated. The idea being, if I've got more glucose here, that means there's less room for water molecules. So there's more water molecules on this side than this side, which means water's going from high to low concentration. While that is technically sort of true, it actually is probably not the best explanation for this. The difference, you could calculate the concentration of water here. And the difference in water concentration is very, very small. Not really enough to account for how much water will cross this and how rapidly. A, a explanation I heard that works a little better for me is to imagine that for each of these glucose molecules, remember it has all of those, um, those places, those polar parts, the OH groups where water can form hydrogen bonds. Imagine that each glucose has a certain number of almost little spots, like sockets around it, where water could form a hydrogen bond with it. Those are almost like a hole that water could fall into. This side has more of those sockets, which means water will tend to move over here to fill those sockets. That's also probably not technically correct. Uh, last time I read, it is difficult to explain to the technical reasons for why this works, but it doesn't really matter. What you need to remember is that water will tend to move toward the higher solute concentration. In osmosis, water moves toward the higher solute concentration. So in this case, water is going to tend to go that way. Now, it's still random movement. Some water is going this way, but more will be going that way. The question now is, so what happens in that case? Well, let's think. If water goes this way, I'm adding more water to this side, what will that do to the concentration of glucose? Same amount of glucose, it can't cross. Same amount of glucose, but in more water, that's a lower concentration, more dilute. So this number starts to go down. Then look at this side. Same amount of glucose, but in less water, it's becoming more concentrated. So this number starts to go up. So as the water goes this way, that's one of the things that's going to happen. 
this num as this number goes down and this number goes up, if we get to the point where those two numbers are equal, water no longer has a reason to cross the barrier. That would work under some circumstances, but in this case, we've got a container with rigid sides, so something else is going to happen. As the water moves this way, the total amount of water on this side of the barrier is going to go up. The total amount on this side is going to go down. We will visibly see the water go from level to not level as the water gets drawn over. Now that does mean this number is going down and that number is going up, but it also means something else. There's more water on this side, which means effectively there's higher water pressure down here. So the pressure now is pushing on water to cross back that way. And we end up with an interesting situation where as water builds up here, the pressure starts rising. And the more water builds up, the higher the pressure becomes until there's enough pressure pushing water back to balance its tendency to come over here toward the higher concentration. When those two tendencies to move are equal, then wa the water is now at equilibrium. And there's equal amounts of water moving this way by osmosis and that way from pressure. That's a true equilibrium situation. In that case, these water levels will not go back to being equal because now this is in balance. And these concentrations may not be equal in that case. In fact, they won't be but they are unequal enough to generate a pull for water in one direction that's now balanced by the pressure pushing it back. When people talk about osmotic pressure, that's what they're talking about. The amount of pressure needed to counteract that tendency for water to move by osmosis. This is a powerful force. The tendency for water to cross toward the higher solute concentration is actually very, very powerful. For example, you may know that plant roots, given time, can break up boulders. If you get a plant growing on a boulder and its roots kind of get down into a crack in that boulder, over time it can split the rock. This is part of how that works. The cells down in there use energy to pump solutes into the cell, which draws water in by osmosis, which causes the cell to swell up. That exerts force outward on the rock. And over time, that can be a lot of force. This is also relevant in the human body, that water moves into and out of our cells based on osmosis. So normally the concentration of solutes inside and outside my cells is about the same, what we call isoosmotic, which means water has no overall tendency to cross. But if I change that, then water may tend to cross one direction or another, which can cause the cells to swell up or shrivel as water either enters or leaves. If, for example, consider this, imagine a red blood cell. We'll talk about those later in the course. Let's say the, uh, the, total, the osmolarity in here is about 300. Now normally, outside in the blood plasma, the osmolarity is also about 300. So water isn't moving in either direction, but what if you take this red blood cell, take it out of your blood and put it into a beaker of pure water, where the, uh, the total amount of solute concentration out here is zero. Which way will water move? Remember, water moves toward the higher solute concentration. So in this case, that's here. So water starts coming in here, which makes this cell swell up, and swell up, and eventually, pop, it'll lice, it'll burst. When you put, when you give someone an IV, you don't give them a water IV, because if you start pumping water into a person's blood, it's going to cause an osmotic disruption like this. Instead, you put in what's known as isotonic solutions, which is something set up so that it has this, it will not cause osmotic movement of water into or out of their cells, at least not very much. Now, one more thing with osmosis. So let's go back to our bucket and our membrane. And let's put some solutes in here. Glucose, 150. 
ribose, 50 and 100. And let's say this membrane allows water to cross, but not glucose and not ribose. Which way will the water move? We might look at this and say, okay, well, there's a higher solute concentration for glucose here, so water's going to go that way. Oh, wait, but there's a higher concentration of ribose here, so it'll go that way. It's going to go both ways? The answer is yes. The way we come up with the overall movement of water is rather than looking at the concentration of any specific solute, we have to look at the overall solute concentration, all of the dissolved things. So the total concentration on this side is 150. And rather than being millimoles of glucose or millimoles of ribose, we say this is 150 MOSM, which is milliosmoles, which doesn't refer to any specific solute, but rather all solutes. This side is the same. Since these two sides have the same osmolarity, that's the term we use here, we say they are isoosmotic and water will have no tendency to move. Or it, more, more accurately, it will move equally in both directions. Now there is one more subtlety to that. What if I imagine that glucose can cross this membrane? In that case, glucose will tend to diffuse down its concentration gradient from high to low. When I start, these two sides have the same osmolarity. However, as glucose goes this way, so there's kind of two ways to think about that. One, as glucose goes this way, the overall osmolarity over here is going to go up. So this will become higher, this will become lower, and water will go that way. Another way, which is not really different and will lead you to the same answer, is to say, which way will water go? Well, I ignore anything that can cross the membrane and only look at the things that can't. So if I take that off, which way will water go? Toward the higher concentration. It'll go toward the ribose. Both of those ways of thinking about it will lead you to the right answer if your question is, which way will water go? The question of the osmolarity technically is still this, but now we get into this idea of tonicity. What, you would say that in the first case, these solutions were both isoosmotic and isotonic. Tonicity refers to which way water will go, and it refers to the solutes which cannot cross the membrane. So in this case, glucose is not part of the tonicity, and we would say this side is hypertonic compared to this side. It will draw, water will get pulled toward that because it has the higher concentration of solutes that cannot cross the membrane. Osmosis can get complicated and it's notoriously confusing. So I'll try to put up some practice problems for it and feel free to ask me questions about it. So we've now talked about diffusion and osmosis, the two main forms of passive transport. At the beginning of our next section, we're gonna talk about active transport. What happens when we don't allow things to just cross the way they do by physics but rather we force them to go in one direction or the other. And what do we have to do to do that? See you then.